The second session focuses on uh, Be Social, uh, social media web archiving, uh, ar archiving at KBR in Belgium. So um, and that's uh, one big project uh, which has been launched by the KBR. It's a two-year project that aims to set up a sustainable strategy for archiving and preserving social media in Belgium. It has uh, six partners, uh, the KBR, so the Royal uh, Belgian Library, the universities of Leuven, uh, Namur, and three different units from the University of Ghent. Um, there will be, I mean, there are uh, four presentations in this session that uh, you have uh, probably watched on uh, Vimeo before. So the first is um, what to select and how to harvest the operational side of social media archiving by, um, by Fien Messens and uh, Peter Heivert. I'm trying to pronounce them here. I hope uh, it's not uh, too uh, wrong. Great. Um, the second one is uh, archiving Belgian social media, how to obtain a representative corpus and how to represent them via an interface. And that one is by Eva Roland, who's a research assistant at Santal. And uh, thirdly, the European copyright law as an obstacle to social media archiving. And uh, that one is by Lise Anne Denis. And the last one is key actors, events, and discourses in the Gorman Reinewelt translation controversy on Twitter. And um, that one will be presented by uh, Peter Merchant. So I would like the panelists to briefly um, talk about uh, what they presented in their video. So to refresh everybody's memory and uh, just to keep the discussion short, I brought uh, something. Uh, which I will use when uh, the talk gets a bit too long. So it's a toy from my one-year-old daughter, and it does a slightly annoying sound. So, and um, with that having been said, I would like to um, have uh, Fien and Peter um, talk about the first um, uh, presentation that they did. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so during the first presentation, Peter and I discussed the first step of social media archiving at B Social, so the selection, and also the second step, so which tools we use to harvest the relevant accounts and, and hashtags. And we discussed the context of the B Social project and also the selection criteria, criteria we used during this project. Uh, so we only harvest Twitter and Instagram. We focus on textual outputs and for legal reasons, we only archive data that is publicly accessible. And the theme of the accounts and hashtags we collect is very broad and focus on, on Belgian cultural heritage. Um, so the approach to the creation of seedless is carried out by the B-Social team and by, by the Belgian public uh, via a crowdsourcing campaign that we launched a year ago. And in the process of archiving our corpus, uh, we use Social Feed Manager and InstaLoader. And with the latter, we notice problems as there is no official API to use, and this with the risk of being blocked if there were too, too many requests. Uh, and we solved this by, by mimicking human scrolling um, and yeah, we concluded that creating lists of accounts, seat lists uh, of hashtags was quite time consuming and also defining objectively what Belgian cultural heritage exactly is was also quite difficult. And also uh, another thing is that tools available uh, sometimes limited us in, in how far we could harvest certain data. So that's the, the first presentation uh, in a nutshell. Thank you very much, Fien. Um, and then I would like to uh, give the word to Eva Roland to um, uh, talk a bit about her uh, presentation. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my presentation is divided into two parts. The first part uh, concerns the methodology we developed to uh, obtain a corpus representative of uh, the Belgian population because it was a question that was uh, far from trivial. Indeed, uh, the tweets don't always have geolocation information or sometimes it falls. It was therefore necessary to implement a methodology capable of selecting only Belgian tweet without exploiting geolocation or language as a primary criterion. And the second part uh, concerns the interface we created with the mill to allow to public to access the collected tweet. We had uh, initially chosen to use the SolarWayback tool, but uh, we noticed that SolarWayback was designed 
to archive uh, web pages and not social media, the way for integrated uh, basic and more complex uh, search functionalities into the tool, as well as various features such uh, as exporting results or generating graphs. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Eva. So uh, the next presentation was by uh, Lisa Denis, who is a researcher in uh, Namur. Hello, everyone. So uh, my presentation was about the application of copyright law to social media archiving and uh, mostly on how it can represent an obstacle uh, to this practice. So I mostly uh, highlighted the fact that this legal matter has difficulties to adapt to digital evolutions and uh, how it has not been taken into account enough uh, at the European level. And so considering uh, the amount of, of content from social media that is protected by copyright, so it can be either uh, text or images or videos, et cetera, um, it is actually almost impossible to, to archive it all without uh, benefiting from an exception to the copyright regime. Uh, because if we don't have an exception, we would have to ask for uh, the authorization of every owner of these copyrights prior to archiving the content, which is uh, impractical. And currently, the exception applicable to archiving practices, uh, which allows to ha avoid having to ask uh, the authorization, um, cannot be applied to digital archives because of a directive from 2001 that does not allow the extension uh, of the exception and uh, because this law must be uh, interpreted restrictively. Thank you, Lisanne. Um, and then I lastly, I would like to give the word to Kita Meshant, uh, who is... Uh, uh, have a who has a very interesting topic and a very uh, sensitive one. So, uh, Peter. Hi, uh, hi all. Uh, thank you for having me here. So, um, our session was uh, actually not really part of our, our presentation. Was actually not really officially part of the social project. It was rather an outcome of an internship in the project, uh, in which a master's student uh, tried to investigate to what extent an archived Twitter data set about a societal event can actually be reused, reused or in order to determine or to outline the main actors, sub-events and different discourses about that event. Um, so it was actually a case study on how social media data collection can support a, a digital humanities scholar in researching a societal event. And this simply by means of off the shelf or out of the box, uh, free or open source software. Uh, our use case or his use case, uh, because a master student is named Ewald. So Ewald focused on what became known in Flanders and in the Netherlands as the Gorman Renevel translation controversy. And I, I will not go into the controversy itself. It basically uh, was a critique on the fact that people uh, from ethnic minorities are actually systematically. Uh, marginalized in, in contemporary Dutch literary fields. Uh, so what did, what did Ewald do? He uh, used Twark to collect in real time, I think about 8,000 tweets about, about the debate. And then he tried to identify the key actors or the key groups in, in this debate uh, using a Network X Python scripts and then visualizing uh, the network using uh, Hefi. Uh, in order to grasp key moments and the chronology of the events, he uh, created tableau visualizations. And in order to identify the different discourses about uh, the topic, uh, he used the topic modeling tool uh, provided by uh, DARIA. And DARIA stands for the Digital Research Infrastructure for the Arts and the Humanities. So uh, basically, the, the use case showed that discourses about the event range, ranged from outrage to disappointment to more nuanced debates about the choice of a suitable translator. But from, from a broader perspective, uh, the tra tra translation controversy also demonstrated how Twitter actually serves as a secondary gatekeeping channel, which reinforces and echoes uh, voices from mainstream media. Uh, finally, from a methodological perspective, I think the use case, and this is, I think, most relevant for this conference, also actually shows that there are several social media analysis tools and even archiving tools uh, out there uh, that can actually be used by non-expert users, uh, such as, for example, humanities uh, researchers. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. 
Um, so uh, I uh, would like to remind everyone that um, you can post your questions in the Q&A tab, uh, which is at the bottom of the, your Zoom window. And uh, we'll get started with some um, general discussions. I would like to start with the technical uh, presentation by Fien and Peter. Um, I was uh, wondering why uh, you chose the tools that you chose. And uh, I mean, you said you evaluated some uh, different tools. And uh, uh, last uh, week, we saw uh, Ilya present a new version of browser tricks. Was that already uh, some possibility when you did the evaluations? Or was your work uh, started earlier than browser tricks? Uh, I will take this one. So yeah, we okay. had um, so we investigated which tools were 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 available for the different platforms. So the first one that we focused on was Twitter because we started with one platform just to see how that goes. So we started with Twitter, and there we picked um, social feed manager specifically um, because it was open source. It's not closed source, so people who want to replicate what we do can actually use these tools um, the same way as we did. So that was actually one of the, the good reasons why we use it. And also the feature, of course, that it had. Um, it was um, easy customizable in the sense that you could just plug in your, your Twitter API details. And then it was easy to schedule the different things that you want to do, whether it's hashtags or, or accounts or a combination of all these things. So actually the usability and the functionality and the fact that it was open source, so basically free. Um, um, actually make it a perfect candidate to, to do that. And also from the presentation, um, there we also highlighted it with the social feed manager itself. There were not real problems like compared to Instagram. Um, and that's mainly because you were, we are able to use the Twitter API, um, but that's of course, regardless of the tool. Um, for InstaLoader, it was a little bit, um, or for Instagram, it's a little bit more uh, difficult because yeah, because there's no dedicated API it's harder for tools to be developed. Um, other tools that would, would allow you um, to, to get with Instagram data will have to rely on some type of crawling. Um, so there it depends on what is actively maintained because it's not because it was used or working two years ago that it's still working because Instagram also takes measures, I'm sorry, against these um, types of scraping that we wanna do. Um, and the one that you mentioned, the browser tricks, um, at that point when we checked it, uh, we didn't see it or it was not um, as um, well known maybe um, when we did our research there. I quickly checked it out and it seems um, to be actually probably more feature rich than the Insta loader uh, there. And it's also able to run it in the cloud and everything. So it would be really interesting if we could compare um, what the advantages are of using one over the other, for example. That's definitely something we're checking out. I found it very interesting that you uh, chose to use uh, dedicated uh, tools for each platform that give you already the scraped content in the sense that uh, uh, a tool like Browser Tricks uh, produces works. So the entirety of the website as it's presented to the user with the menu with uh, all the uh, the images and so on, which uh, you don't necessarily want to analyze if you're just interested in the user posted content. Um, was that a conscious choice directly from the beginning that you didn't want the full websites uh, with the replayability and that you only wanted the textual content uh, in your archive? Or was that something that you found that uh, there were better tools for um, using the API and uh, Insta Loader, and the other thing wasn't even a possibility. Um, so we we checked also to have like the look and feel of the websites. For example, for for Twitter, we also investigated that. Um, of course, you're not using the Twitter API, so you will also bump into the restriction that they want you don't want you to crawl it um, using a bot like system. I mean, the website is meant for users, so it's. Um, easier to detect when it's not a user. And there were also um, then concerns regarding the legal concerns, because are you allowed to just like copy and download websites as they are to look and feel um, because of that as well. And technically when we did some tests, um, like your harvesting was, was um, interrupted for more often. 
just because of the way that you're crawled and actually other websites and their and their tools. So it's something that we investigated. If you're if you're purely interested in the data itself, like the tweets or the images, then using an API or a tool that only cares about the contents, it's a better way because you don't um, run into the, the the obstacles that you get when you also want to have the whole look and feel of the the website. So it depends a little bit on the use case. There are definitely tools to do it. But if you want to have everything look and feel included, then you will have some more technical difficulties as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. Afin, you also would like to add something to this? Yeah, we also did a test case using KBRs, uh, the library's own social media platform, so Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as a sort of case study to capture the, the look and feel uh, of KBRs uh, social media platforms. Uh, but yeah, in, so as, as Peter says, in, in a real pilot within the research project, the focus is put on, on harvesting texts and, and the look and feel is somewhat neglected due to, to yeah, legal reasons around the whole look and feel. Um, and we use Conifer for, for harvesting that data, the whole look and feel from, from KBR's um, website, uh, and social media. But yeah, this was quite time. Uh, in, intensive since Facebook always stopped refreshing their page um, after numerous times scrolling. So that was quite of a hurdle. So we did some test cases with, with uh, the look and feel for KBO social media. Okay, thank you. Um, and that brings me directly to a question for uh, Eva, um, because you said that uh, you need to sort of find who the Twitter users from Belgium are that you should include and um, you uh, said that you also employed a machine learning model. Uh, can you talk a bit more about that? Uh, what uh, that model was and what you used to train it and what, uh, because you said there were good results. I think that would be interesting for a lot of other libraries as well. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, as I said in the presentation, we used the followers of Belgian celebrities account and we then filtered this list uh, as it possible that there are followers uh, we are not Belgium. And to filter this uh, account, so we use a machine uh, uh, learning model trained uh, with the <laughs> in French uh, XG boost algorithm uh, based on certain uh, characteristics. For example, the model will look at the percentage of tweets uh, written in the target language. Among the last uh, 200 tweets of the account, the number of URLs uh, coming from Belgium in the last uh, 200 tweets, etc. From this uh, characteristic, it is able to tell if uh, an account is Belgian or not. Okay, yeah, that sounds uh, a very good plan. Um, yeah, I, th I think that also answers one of the questions in QA by uh, Leon, uh, by Megan Leon, um, which was about yeah how to identify the, the Belgian uh, uh, social media. So that just to be clear, this just worked with Twitter, or did you also? Okay, thank you. Um, I had another question. Uh, you said now that um, you have a target language. Was the target language just French or was it also Dutch and German, which are other languages, uh, official languages of Belgium or even English, which is probably also used uh, by Belgians? Yeah, there are no limitations regarding languages as long as there is a strong link with with, with Belgium. Um, so in the manually created tick list, a specific effort was made to include hashtags and accounts in German, Dutch and French. So the national languages in Belgium, but also uh, English. Um, so yeah, all languages are welcome. Okay, great. Uh, the, and then coming back to Eva, uh, in your search interface, you showed an example with uh, économie circulaire, uh, so the French word for uh, circular economy, which brings me back to my question about languages. Uh, is there any way to also identify the English term or the German term or the, I'm, I'm going to try this one, the Kringloop economy uh, in Dutch. Uh, from the same, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> from the same uh, query? Uh, we don't deal with uh, other languages, but if, for example, an account uh, that has been validated uh, in Belgium has written something in English, then uh, yes, our interface will uh, display it. This is the case, for example, with uh, Elodie uh, Lamer, who is a Belgian journalist. Uh, but we also tweet in English, and uh, we don't have the prospect of integrating uh, other language. Uh, no, because that's not our objective. 
Thank you. And um, I mean, since we're uh, talking about languages, about uh, data, about uh, privacy, I was uh, wondering a bit, I mean, uh, Lisa and Denis, you were focusing a lot on copyright. And however, we're um, dealing with a lot of personal data as well. Uh, you br mentioned it briefly now and also in your talk. Is that something that uh, you would have done another five hour talk about or and uh, you needed more time or a second presentation? Or is that something that you think is a bit less of an issue in this case? No, uh, the GDPR and personal data protection was actually a big part of uh, our legal analysis but it will require its own five hours presentation because it is quite complex. Um, for this, I chose to, to talk about copyright because it is something that needs to be improved because currently it represents uh, an obstacle while uh, the GDPR uh, doesn't really. So obviously social media uh, contain a lot of personal data. So um, the respect of the GDPR must be central to any social media archiving practices. And uh, notably because of um, long-term preservation of the personal data, etc. Uh, but fortunately for us, there is actually a derogatory regime uh, in the GDPR for archiving practices in the public interest. So it allows us to avoid uh, several obligations uh, from the GDPR. Um, for example, uh, the storage limitation principle or uh, the rights uh, of individuals, such as uh, the right of access or the right to erasure. Um, and in exchange, if you would, uh, of avoiding these obligations, we have to, to put in place appropriate safeguards uh, as this, uh, qualified. Uh, for example, uh, pseudonymization, uh, implementation of procedures to handle data subject requests, uh, strong transparency or security management. But we benefit uh, from this regime because uh, we meet all the conditions uh, required. But one of them is uh, that the preservation of archives must be legally imposed. So it is not a derog derogatory regime that will be able to, to adapt to a lot of uh, smaller structures that want to, to archive social media or any personal data. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, we're waiting for your uh, next talk next year, uh, maybe uh, <laughs> on uh, the detail of the GDPR uh, problems. Um, about copyright, um, the thing is, uh, I think everybody's facing the same copyright problems in Europe because we have the same uh, European directives. Uh, however, uh, I was wondering, because in Luxembourg and in other countries, uh, there is the legal deposit for internet publications. And as far as we understand uh, the text and data mining directive from 2019, um, that means that we legally hold, the, I mean, we legitimately hold the content uh, because we have legal deposit and then through text and data mining, we're legally allowed to share the data with others as long as they have uh, legitimate con uh, access through the library. Is um, that legal deposit a possibility in Belgium or is that something that you would not consider? Uh, yes, but actually um, regarding legal deposit obligations, uh, I must highlight that even if a, a state has a legal deposit obligation for digital content, it does not mean that all other legislations are set aside and don't need to apply. So even if uh, we include uh, internet uh, publications in the legal deposit obligation, we still have to respect copyright. Um, so currently in Belgium, we have a legal deposit obligation, but for non-digital uh, content. And so if we want to, it is an intention to ex extend this uh, legal deposit to digital content because otherwise it will be complicated to archive it. Uh, and if we do so, we have to include uh, an exception to copyright alongside it. And uh, if I, I understood clear, clearly you what you said, uh, you were talking about access to, to the archives and actually regarding copyright, you really have to, to distinguish access considerations, so which is called communication to the public uh, in copyright law, and the reproduction of the content, because it's actually not the same acts and they are submitted to, to different uh, regimes. Uh, so in principle, uh, to reproduce a content protected by copyright or to communicate it to the public, you have to ask for the, the copyright owner authorization. And then there are exceptions, so cases where you don't need to ask uh, such authorization, but the exceptions are not the same for access and for reproduction. 
And actually, the, the exception for access is uh, uh, can be adapted to can be applica applicable to to digital content, but the exception for pollution cannot. So this is where uh, our issue is. So in the directive, I think the exception for archiving practices um, is not uh, extendable to to digital content, especially since it is mentioned in a recital from the directive. So in the beginning of the, the text. Uh, before the articles. And as there is a principle in copyright law that all exceptions must be interpreted restrictively in order to protect copyright as much as possible, I think we cannot uh, interpret it as covering uh, now digital content. It didn't prevent some states to, to still implement that exception, including digital content. So it is the case for France and uh, Denmark, for example. Uh, we haven't. <laughs> And uh, I doubt that it would be uh, totally lawful to, to extend the exception considering that the directive um, does not really allow it. So it is why I think it's, it is needed that the European legislator intervenes to also acknowledge the, the need to archive uh, born digital content and to specify that uh, these exceptions are still applicable to archiving of digital content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very complicated matter, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not uh, <laughs> going to uh, go into great detail there. Um, I, I think the, the exception we're using is the fact that we're allowed to show uh, all our collections, uh, be they um, 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 physical or digital, uh, inside the library to uh, people. Um, so that part is covered, and then the part that uh, if you have an access to the content you're also allowed to text and data mine it so maybe it's uh, it's a bit broad i don't know it's like, uh, yes but it's technically debatable. you're not allowed to to reproduce the content from the the web <laughs> but this exception is only applicable when you already have the, the the content in your archives and then you can provide access but yeah it's complicated <laughs> yes yes it is complicated yes <laughs> Sorry, I just muted myself. Um, so uh, I'm not going to ask uh, Peter uh, Merchant the same question about uh, whether it's uh, easy or complicated to legally uh, do the Twitter archiving uh, that um, you did. But um, I was interested in the workflow that uh, you have at the University of Ghent for such projects, because uh, I'm assuming it's not the first project that you're doing with Twitter um, or social media. and um, you have this uh, Twork uh, JSON data set now, and I was wondering, are you considering it research data that your um, institution is preserving, or is it um, somehow transferred to the KBR as part of the future web archive? Uh, it's like, who takes care of the long-term preservation in this case? Yeah, uh, very good uh, question, Eve. Um, uh, actually, the, the master student, Ewald, uh, did his, his master thesis at uh, the Catholic University of Leuven, so not at, at Kent University. Uh, so my best guess is that his thesis, together with the uh, archive JSON sets, is stored in the yeah, in the institutional repository of that university. But actually, I should uh, check to make sure. If not, we will probably uh, yeah, preserve it on, on SODA, where we also uh, already preserved some other results of the project. So that is the Belgium Federal uh, Data Archive for Social Sciences and, and Humanities. Uh, that's a shared uh, federal system or? Yeah, indeed. OK, oh, great. Um, which brings me uh, to uh, back to a question for Peter Hayward. Um, there's a question from Taras Nazaruk. Nazaruk. Um, he was wondering uh, if user interface context of where and how the tweets were posted, retweeted, and commented should also be archived. And uh, the um, tailor-made tools usually just um, archive the content itself. And what are like those interactions and comments should also be preserved. So. You mean like whether a um, tweet is reposted, uh, retweeted or not, you mean? Yes, and uh, reactions it... to the tweet. I mean, if you're just archiving one person, somebody else might re react um, to it. Yeah, from, from um, 
the things that is that is currently um, downloaded, for example, if you have a hashtag and someone does a retweet of a tweet and adds that hashtag, then you will see that it's a retweet, but it will not automatically like crawl the tweet of the retweet and, and so on if it doesn't have that hashtag included or if it's not one of the accounts that you follow. So if you would tweet something uh, with the hashtag of this conference, um, I can retweet that, but if I exclude that hashtag, then it will not be archived because I didn't explicitly mention that. Um, it will be, it, you will have a link between them, but it will stop there. It will not necessarily do that. You would need to have um, like some special edition that you would say, okay, once you see something replying and it becomes a thread, keep harvesting the thread as well. So that would need some addition, but technically, of course, it's possible. And it should be definitely possible with the Twitter API because you get the IDs of the tweets and so on. So it should uh, be technically possible to actually follow like the conversation more or less if you want to. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I have to say there that uh, we as the National Library of Luxembourg tried to get an API access. And I think maybe we're not the only ones. And uh, Twitter refused um, to give us the API access. Um, it probably also depends on which person at Twitter is responsible for answering your request or something. But um, since uh, for both of your use cases, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it worked or like, I don't know how many Twitter uh, fee, Twitter ABI accesses you had uh, during the Be Social project. Um, would that be something that you would be maybe willing to share how you did the application? Uh, it's like the justifications that you added. Uh, maybe that's for both Peters. Or... Um, yeah, actually, the student, the master student, uh, didn't use a, a research account. Just, and the data set he collected was also very small. Eh? So it included, I think, 9,000 tweets. And that was it. Ah, so no uh, API access was request, uh, required? Yeah, he had one, but not on a research level. OK. okay. Yeah, for the one where we did like the all the hashtags and accounts that Finn mentioned, we did have a we did have a application for like a Twitter app that they would call it, and there we mentioned that it was for research and that was for a limited time. Um, so that might help in the sense that they know that it's for research purposes and not for commercial purposes, and it's also for limited times. So it's not that you want to store them forever or keep harvesting forever. Um, as well, you will still have limitations in the sense that you cannot do a million tweets a minute, so they will also complain. But like you would still need to spread it out as well. And the social feed manager allows you to um, include multiple um, like credentials. So if you have multiple accounts or got multiple applications for the Twitter API, you could spread it and actually um, distribute your requests for harvesting across these different credentials, so you don't hit the limitations. Um, as well but again you still have to get like the access for your app um for that um yeah that's a very interesting point i mean if uh yeah you are you want to select uh, so many things that uh, you're not allowed to uh by the platform and in that sense it's uh, um the social media pose a challenge because it's the content of the users that's actually locked up and controlled by the platforms uh, and we don't really have access to it anymore and the users don't either um, there was a question in the chat and uh, about well copyright or i don't know it's like a, yeah, i think it's copyright uh, by katrin waynes uh, so i think that's uh, one for you uh, lisanne um, what about the rights of the social media platforms themselves? I think this is not an issue in the current project because you didn't really get the social media look and feel like the logos and images and so on. But um, the question was, how big is the risk that institutions uh, that archive would look and feel will get a copyright claim uh, from the platforms? Um... Well, regarding uh, the platform, so for the content that people uh, post on the platform, uh, in the general conditions of both Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, actually the platforms uh, grant themselves a license over what people post on the platforms. So to give them the authorization to actually uh, diffuse it 
uh, online, uh, but still the initial copyright owner is still the owner. So they don't take the copyright from people who post on the platform. So on this, if we have, uh, we should have an exception in order to avoid having to ask for each uh, copyright owner the authorization. And regarding the look and feel, well, there is actually um, obviously a copyright of the platform itself uh, on it. But again, if we have an exception, we can avoid having to ask the authorization. But uh, there is still a need to, to check if it is not branded. Um, there, there, there could be a brand uh, on the look and feel itself of the platform, I think. But would that be likely? I mean, that's... I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, you're also not now uh, obliged to be the, the official lawyer of the whole of uh, the European <laughs> IAPC. <laughs> but knowing uh, Twitter and Facebook, I think it is likely that there is a brand. Okay. Um, let me just continue with a question from Ricardo Basilio. Um, in the case of Archivo.pt, some Twitter accounts, uh, for example, official government accounts, uh, are recorded without logging in with a crawler. Uh, so with Brosler in their case, uh, which it's basically just um, an emulated browser, to ensure that they are collecting only publicly visible content. Um, they are made available like any other website in the archive interface of archivo.pt, which is publicly available on the internet. And um, he was wondering, how do you see this practice in light of your research on European directives? Um, this is more related to uh, privacy matters, actually, because um, content that is uh, restricted to certain users uh, or something can be considered as, as private or protected by uh, business uh, secrecy as well, uh, in some cases. So it is way more simple to, to just talk with uh, public accessible content. So for privacy uh, matters, especially, um, I don't think I don't think it's, if it's a good idea uh, to go into much details, but basically you have the right to privacy of people that must be balanced with the right to information of people, and if they published the information privately, it will be less likely to enter the right to information. It's it's very complicated to enter into details uh, in a few minutes, but yeah, for all legal reasons, it is way more simple. To, to only collect what is publicly available. Um, in that sense, uh, I think we all as members of IAPC and especially those uh, who are based in Europe, we have very similar challenges because uh, at least in Europe, we have the common directives in all the countries, even though the, the law might be different in special points. Do you see uh, your work directly applicable in other countries in Europe, or do you think that uh, there should be, uh, I mean, a legal analysis uh, for every country that is done uh, on its own? Uh, well, regarding uh, privacy issues and the GDPR, it is obviously applicable throughout uh, Europe. For copyright, uh, I've made an analy analysis of the European directives, but also I've adapted it to, to what has been actually implemented in Belgian law. So for copyright, it must be more, um, um, so each member state must go more in depth uh, as to what is actually adapted in international law. But yeah, for privacy and GDPR, it is the same. Well, that would also be uh, already super interesting for everyone if uh, we would have a, your, I mean, a solution or at least uh, guidelines for what we can do and not do with web archives for uh, GDPR reasons. That would be uh, super interesting. So thank you. Um, I have a, well, we have five minutes left. So I would like to uh, take some more questions from the audience. Um, I have a question from uh, Rus uh, Kusjonovic. Um, with Twitter being bought by Elon Musk, do you anticipate it becoming more difficult to do what you did in the future, such as the complications you had with Facebook, which is why you didn't include that platform in the Be Social project? So I don't know who wants to take that one. Um, maybe uh, Peter or Fien or the other Peter. Uh, from a technical point, um, well, if the if, yeah, if they decide to to um, shut down the API, you get like in the 
in the same boat as with Instagram that you will have to resolve to scraping. So that would be the first step um, that would raise some red flags to, to people who want to use the data of Twitter. So it, but for Twitter, it mostly depends on that. Um, how easy will it be to get access? I mean, maybe you still get access, but you will have to jump through a lot of hoops to actually get access. Um, because with Facebook, you can get some access, but it's not so straightforward as with Twitter. So yeah, it all depends on the decisions that are made now that um, money has been exchanged uh, for Twitter, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a last question from the audience that I would like Fien to uh, answer. Well, you're starting to type in the chat, but uh, maybe you can still answer that one live. So you mentioned it uh, from Pierre Newing. Uh, so you mentioned in your presentation that you attempted to crowdsource nominations. Did you receive many nominations and mm -hmm. were any particularly surprising? Yeah, so at the beginning of May, we had around several, several suggestions by the, the Belgian public, which is, I think, quite okay, since it was the first big crowdsourcing campaign for KBR. Um, and indirectly, we social and the whole social media archiving uh, were also put in the picture in, in the Belgian press. So we had a lot of media attention, uh, which was really great. So it was also sort of a promotion campaign. Um, and topic wise, I think we received more hashtags than accounts. And in terms of teams, topics, it's mainly things that are linked to, to Belgian uh, hot topic hot topics events for example hashtag belgian pride or hashtag belgian fries or certain strikes so so the hashtags are more linked to important events happening in belgium that week or that month uh, so that was uh, the crowdsourcing campaign and it's still running till the end of, of the be social projects um, okay well um, thank you very much all of you uh, for this uh, very interesting session and your presentations uh, that was uh, a very interesting deep look into the Be Social project, and uh, I'm sure we'll uh, hear some more about it next year uh, when the project has finished. You'll have more things to show us. So um, everybody thank uh, help me in thanking them. <laughs>